Hey guys and welcome back to another Elden Ring lore reaction video. Today we're watching Varty Vidya's Elden Ring's Demigods Explained. You guys have requested this one so I thought hey why not let's do another one. Really looking forward to this one I hope you guys are too. Let's see what it's all about. Sit back relax and let's go. Alright so here we are let's uh, let's see what this one's all about. The Demigods are each and all the direct offspring of Queen Marika. There was Godwin, Morgoth, Moog, Radan, Rikard, Rani, Mikola, and Melania, Blade of Mikola. Melania, Blade of Mikola. Melania, Blade of Mikola. And yes. Melania. <laughs> Not again. All of these demigods had fallen from grace by the time the shattering. Occurred. I know the feeling. But in this video, I want to mostly talk about the origins of these characters. Who awesome. these demigods were before the fall. And some of these demigods fell a long way indeed. Before he became this unsightly mess, Godwin the Golden was quite the heroic figure. He was born of the promising union between Lord Godfrey and Queen Marika, and he achieved great renown for his bravery in one of their wars at least, the War of the Ancient Dragons. This war began when Gransax, a great ancient dragon, rained calamity down upon Laindel, marking the only time in historical record that Laindel's walls had fallen. It's not clear why Gransax first attacked, but fortifying themselves against lightning, the Knights of the Erd Tree weathered his assault and Gransax was defeated. However, this was only the beginning, and a bitter war against the ancient dragons was to follow. During this war, the Erd Tree Sentinels had an epiphany that the only way to truly protect the Erd Tree was to become dragons themselves. The damn Erd Tree Sentinels. They kick my butt so many times. And can I just say the the like the B-roll footage that he gets for these is so awesome. It's so good. And so Unreal. despoiling the corpses of their foes, the grotesque sentinels served the Erd Tree, but fought with the claws of the enemy instead. In the end, the ancient dragons were routed once again. In a graveyard of swords by the Stormcaller Church, the end of the war is commemorated. Here we learn that during battle, Godwin the Golden defeated Fortisax, called the mightiest dragon of them all. However, he did not kill Fortisax. Instead, he befriended him. And it was in this act that the powers of the ancient dragons truly became a part of Laindel. After all, only those loved by dragons can survive the ordeal of cladding their bodies in lightning. So, from an unlikely oh, friendship, that, man. an ancient dragon cult was born in the capital city, and the Knights of Laindel learned to worship the dragons and wield their lightning. Lanciax, mm, okay. sister of Fortisax, even took human form to better commune with the knights. It was officially decided that the worship of the ancient dragons did not conflict with belief in the Erd Tree, and it was all thanks to Godwin, commander of the dragon's golden lightning, and a true child of the golden lineage but now let's talk so that makes sense why they have so much lightning and all those dragons in um in lendell crazy that pay that place gave me a lot of pain not about you guys but that lightning those lightning knights sheesh bro they were annoying talk about in Morgoth a good way and moog in a good way the omen twins who were also born of godfrey and marika's golden lineage first what is an omen well, to put it simply, an omen is an accursed child seen as mm. impure, as they are born with horns on the body and face. When this happens, the correct thing to do, culturally at least, is to cut off the horns of the omen, an act which usually causes them to perish. It's pretty messed up. But some omen do survive this process, and some omen are even given a cleaver crafted specifically for them and awarded as a tool of war, although these weapons are bestowed with a readiness to take them away. We find one such omen in an Erd Tree camp upon the Altus Plateau. Before you fight it, you might have noticed another omen nearby writhing in its sleep. It's said that omens see evil spirits in their nightmares, and I think this omen is dreaming, haunted by the vengeful spirits of its accursed kin. This brings us to the Omen Killers, who are horrifying butchers oh, those of twisted fellas. conscience. They wear these horns. I only met one of these guys that was in that Albanuic dark town thing. I think we fought him. Maybe we met two. 
We might have met two, actually. One in Lindale. Is there one in Lindale? You have to let me know. I think we fought these fellas. I didn't know what they were, who they were, what they were doing. Haunt masks that make a mockery of the omen's nightmares, and these butchers hunt the omen and amputate their horns. The first okay. omen killer was named Rollo, a famous perfumer who had to imbibe a physic to rid himself of emotion so that he could better perform his tasks. Remember, it seems many omen have their horns excised when they're very young. That's definitely disturbing enough to warrant an emotion-killing physic in my mm. book. However, yeah. if the omen is born of royalty, then their horns are not cut off, but the omen is kept underground, unbeknownst to anyone, and imprisoned for eternity. By way of example, you would have seen all kinds of omen confined to the sewers beneath Lane Dell. But why are omen considered to be accursed in the first place? Some of them are clearly intelligent, so what's inherently wrong with being born with horns and great strength? Well, it's important to remember, I think, that this curse might only really exist in the context of the Golden Order. After all, those afflicted with omen horns are not able to return to the Erd Tree for rebirth and are said to be born outside of its grace. But why does the Golden Order disavow the omen, then? Well, it's hard to say for sure, but my working theory is that it's to do with the Crucible. According to this ancient incantation, horns were once an aspect of the Erd Tree's primordial Crucible, where all life was once blended together. And with the exception of a couple of Crucible Knights in and around Landell, we know that the Golden Order has started to distance itself from most things that touch upon the Crucible. While mm. things like horns, knots, feathers, and scales once grew on the human body and were considered signifiers of the divine, now they are disdained as impurities as civilization has advanced. We learn this from the knot, scale, and feather talismans, all of which are guarded by omen, or dropped by omen killers, no less. Unfortunately for the Order of the Erd Tree, these once divine impurities seem to crop up in some births, whether they like it or not. It is so crazy how everything is connected. Like when you when you honestly when you're playing the game, you're just like, oh, this is a new area, this is these enemies, oh these enemies are back, blah blah blah. You know how it is. And then when you see this and you see how everything is just connected and there's a meaning behind everything, it's just crazy. It really is. It makes you want to play the game all over again once you understand more of it. This is so good. So good. Almost like it's a genetic trait, as if it touches upon the crucible at the root of the Erd Tree. And so you have to ask, is it really a curse to be born as a graceless omen? Well, as with most curses in these games, I think that depends on your perspective. Mm. In any case, Moog and Morgoth were omen royalty and thus they were born into a wretched mire far below the earth, horns and all. Here they were kept under the strictest confinement. Each of them were bound with charmed shackles that were covered in roots or thorns and bathed in golden magic. It seems very few people were supposed to know that they even existed. Morgoth, for his part, renounced and despised his accursed omen blood, but his brother Moog embraced it. Deep underground, Moog stood before an outer god, a being called the Formless Mother who craves wounds, a being capable of bestowing power upon accursed blood. In this moment, Moog's accursed blood erupted with fire, and he became besotted with the defilement that he was born into. Here, deep below the earth, he would go on to build a dynasty of blood in reverence of a mother, something it seems he never truly had. As for Morgoth, he was born into the same accursed fate as his twin brother, but despite not being blessed with grace, he loved the Erd Tree all the same, and even took it upon himself to crawl out of the sewers and become the Erd Tree's protector when the Erd Tree needed him most. In the end, he rightfully Crazy. became the Omen King and Lord of Landell. Omen or not, he was, after all, born of Godfrey and Marika's golden lineage. Of course, Absolutely the marriage crazy. between Godfrey and Marika would be ended, and before long, Marika remarried with another man, a champion named Radigan, who Marika calls her other half. He became second Elden Lord and the King Consort, but he also brought with him three children from a previous marriage that he had had with a Carrion Queen named Renala. These children were Rani, 
Rikard, and Radan. And they all became demigod stepchildren after Radigan's union, reunion, with Queen Marika. Possessed of his father's flaming red Absolutely. hair, Radan was fond of its heroic implications and considered himself to be born of a great champion. Yet he also looked up to another man, Godfrey, the first Elden Lord, Queen Marika's first husband and the Lord of the Battlefield. But Radan wasn't just the son of Radigan and an aspiring lord of the battlefield, he was also the son of Ranala, who was head of the Academy of Raya Lucaria and Queen of Caria. So as a Carrion... It's kind of messed up how they're all related. Like, it really is. I didn't even like think it, think that was a thing when I was playing this game at the beginning. I, like, we kind of learned it along the way, but it, I just think it's, it's crazy. They're all related. What the hell? Royal, inclined towards sorcery, Radan bent his will towards mastering gravitational magics. Rock sling, gravity well, collapsing stars, these techniques were taught to him in Celia, the town of sorcery, all so he would never have to abandon his beloved but scrawny steed. That said, before long, his powers would be put towards a more cosmic purpose than simply allowing him to ride his own horse. Radan was taught gravitational magic by an alabaster lord, a member of a race of ancients with skin of stone who was said to have risen to life when a meteor struck long ago. And when his lessons were complete, Radan uttered these chilling words. Thank you for your tutelage. For now, I can challenge the stars. And of course, he did conquer the stars, and the very constellations Damn. would be halted by his strength. But of course, you kind of have to ask, why? Why was it necessary to conquer the stars in the first place? Well, I have a couple of theories. Theory one is that it was done in self-defense. After all, according to the sword gravestone, Radan was protecting Celia. What's more, gravitational magic has destructive power, and many gravitational beasts are proof of that destructive power. A being named Astel had even come down to the lands between in the past and destroyed a place called the Eternal City. What's more, Celians are descendants of the Eternal, positioned right above the Eternal City underground, so there is an argument to be made for Radan purely defending Celia for some reason here. But hmm. it's possible for Radan to have fought in this conflict and to have made the first move as well. So this is theory two, that Radan conquered the stars as a preventative measure in service to the greater will. According to a set of astrologer items, the night sky cradles fate. There's even a banished sect of people called the Nox, who live deep below the earth in eternal anticipation of the coming age of stars and their lord of night. Long ago, these people invoked the ire of the Greater Will, so it would make sense that those in service to the Greater Will might have sought to arrest the stars and put an end to this fate. What's more, Radan was just a huge fanboy of Godfrey, and he seems to have more loyalty to the Erd Tree than to the Moon. Finally, the telescope item description says that the fate once writ in the night skies had been fettered by the Golden Order, so surely this is referencing Radan's actions, and it levels the blame at the Golden Order. But putting Radan's motivations aside, it's a fact that the stars were held back, and that this had great consequences for many, especially for the rest of his Carrion royal family. Let me explain. The fate of the Carrion royal family is guided by the stars, as is the fate of Lady Rani, first heir in the Carrion royal line. But General Radan is the conqueror of the stars, who stood up to the swirling constellations, halting their movement in a smashing victory. And so, if General Radan were defeated, the stars would once again resume their movement, as would Lady Rani's destiny. Lunar Princess Rani was the daughter. This is crazy. It, this is so good. This video is so good. Like. So good. I just want to play this game all over again. Please, I did forget to say, please do like and subscribe to his channel, Vati Vidya. I'll leave a link down in the description down below of his channel, of this video. So please do, if you haven't already, go like and subscribe to him. Because, man, he does a fantastic job with these videos and they are so good. Deserves all the support he can get, that is for sure. Daughter of Radigan and Renala, and sister to Radan. 
Interestingly, if you look at her true body atop the Divine Tower, it looks like she might have also inherited the red hair of Radigan. Cool detail. But unlike her brother, Radan, she quite clearly took after her mother, Mor, who was Renala, head of the Carrion royal family. The House of Caria has this storied history, one that seems to go way back to the astrologers. In the Carrion Manor, we find one of their treasures, the Sword of Night and Flame. It reads, Astrologers, who preceded the sorcerers, established themselves in mountaintops that nearly touched the sky and considered the fire giants their neighbors. Renala herself was an astrologer, always chasing the stars in her youth. Then she met the full moon, and in time, the astrologer became a queen, establishing the House of Caria as royalty. Caria appears to have a matriarchal Ooh, hierarchy place. with multiple princesses and Carrion knights that serve as their retainers. There's the Elden Bling again, and that that um those hands, oh man, they still give me the creeps. Now, however, there they is still give me the one creeps. princess, Rani, daughter of Renala. And at the time of her birth, she would have been set to inherit quite a lot of power indeed, for the Carrion royal family was at its height, and her mother was not only queen, she was also head of the Academy of Raya Lucaria, having bewitched them with the enchanting power of the full moon. Leading the young Rani by the hand, Renala guided her daughter to a meeting with a moon of her own. What Rani beheld was cold, dark, and veiled in occult mystery. A mm. dark moon, a sort of twin to Renala's own full moon. You can even see both of these hanging in the sky if you stargaze from the heights of the moonlight plateau. Another who guided Rani was a character called the Snowy Crone, who the young Rani encountered deep in the woods. When you look at Rani, it's actually the likeness of this snow witch that you're seeing, as the doll that now houses Rani's soul was modeled after her, probably mm. as a sign of respect. Clearly, Rani looked up to this mysterious woman. She became Rani's secret mentor, and she even knew about the Dark Moon, teaching the young Rani to fear it as she imparted her cold sorceries. So, what do these moons represent? That's just a theory, but I think the moons kind of act as guides. Uh, the lost black moon of Noxtella, for example, was the guide of countless Beautiful. stars. What's more, Rani and Renala were heavily influenced by their moons. Renala's moon bewitched the academy that she became the head of, and Rani's dark moon, for its part, also imparts wisdom and leads a voyage in the Age of Stars ending. They could even be outer gods. And yet, for all of this guidance, Caria and Leonia as a whole have experienced steep decline. Radigan betrayed the House of the Moon. Radan locked the stars out of motion. The Academy town is flooded to the north, Caria has been ruined in the west, and the stars and moon have gone their separate ways. Mm. Nevertheless, Rani, last princess of Caria, remains, carefully setting new plans into motion. Sibling to Rani and Radan was a Ooh. man named... I felt that transition from like, we went to like, moon and stars, now we've gone into a bit of darkness it seems. The Volcano Manor. I like that transition. A little bit of darkness coming our way. Rikard, who was lord of the volcano. The music. Manor. There is evidence yes, that Rikard was friendly with his siblings. He conspired with his sister Rani later on. And there's even a portrait of Radan hung in the volcano manor, as oh. well as a portrait of Rikard himself before the fall. Yeah, of course. Item descriptions mark Rikard as stern, ambitious, heroic, and blasphemous. A part of this blasphemy was opposing the Erd Tree which actually drew many knights to his banner, for Rikard believed in taking by force, just as the gods did, and clearly many believed that he would usher in a new age. The armor set of the Gelmir knights reveals to us what were once very loyal soldiers. The crest of red feathers are there to symbolize Rikard's pedigree as Lord Radigan's son, and the emblem upon their chest piece represents a lord who had lofty ambitions. However, as Rikard delved into the ancient secrets of Mount Gelmir, he came across the immortal Great Serpent, an ancient deity that aligned with Rikard's ambitions. And so, Rikard fed himself to the Great Serpent so that he might devour, grow, and live eternally. 
That's crazy. Alas, this was too much for his knights, and they believed that their master's heroic ambitions had degenerated into mere greed. So they searched desperately for a weapon with which they might hold their lord. And they found it too. The immortal serpent had lived for a long time, and so there was also a weapon to kill it that had been designed long ago as well. A mm. serpent hunter. But it was too late. As the lord lost his dignity, so too did the knights lose their master. Not that it bothered Rikard. Mm, no, we can devour God together. I've always been Next, we need to crazy. discuss Melania Scary. and Mikola. These two were twins Oof. as they were born. No, Rikard, please. Anyway, <laughs> as you know, Radigan's marriage with Renala did not last. Afterwards, he returned to the Golden Order and became Queen Marika's consort. But what I haven't yet mentioned is that together they were blessed with two demigod children, the so-called twin prodigies. Now, in the last lore video, I briefly proposed that these two twins were born after the Shattering, after Radigan and Marika had merged together to become a single god. However, mm. I've since changed my mind. I think Millennia and Mikula were clearly born before the Shattering. There's just so much okay. proof that these two twins were a force that were influencing the world long before the Shattering took place. Uh, anyway, both of these twins were born afflicted. Specifically in the Japanese text, it's said that their births were vulnerable. Mikola was born afflicted with eternal youth, and Millennia, for her part, was vulnerable to rot. Interestingly, Millennia's Scarlet Rot is actually an outer god. This outer god, like many others in the game, seems to have an order that is able to be imposed upon the world via an Empyrean vessel, and Millennia was that vessel. And while the Scarlet Rot is pretty terrible, uh, you can sort of argue that it's got a beauty to it. Um, according to Gowry, the Order of Rot is resplendent. It's a cycle of death and rebirth. Kind of like the Lotus Flower, which is a flower that blooms anew, beautiful and fresh, from mud. I actually have art of this flower hanging in my home. I always love the symbol of it. I actually have lots of art hanging now, and I'm going to talk about all of this artwork that you can buy at the end of the video. Anyway, so Millennia nice. the Empyrean was vulnerable to and afflicted by the Scarlet Rot. There was said to be no cure to this, and while fire and consecration seemed to be somewhat effective at warding it off, Millennia would slowly lose her physical self to the Rot. Interestingly, mm. old legends of the Scarlet Rot have persisted in the world for generations, and we learn more about the Rot God from the Blue Dancer charm. The Dancer in Blue represents a fairy who, in legend, bestowed a flowing sword upon a blind swordsman. Blade in hand, the swordsman sealed away an ancient god, a god that was Rot itself. Specifically, this god was long ago sealed away in the stagnant water that is downstream of the Ainsel River underground. And wherever Rot appears, the kindred of Rot appear as well. These mm. are pests and servants of the Rot. Pests, you say? They were so annoying. I hated those little things, those, um, oh shit, those arrow things that just flew to you. Like, they hit you, whatever you do, go, you hide, they go, shoot. Didn't like them. And now, Don't in the like current them. age, these are servants that have been forsaken by Millennia, who is their new goddess. So, this blind swordsman with the flowing curved that sword thing. actually went on to become Millennia's mentor. So, technically, it's him that we have to blame for this goddamn attack. The prosthesis mm. wearer heirloom tells us more. A talisman engraved with a scene from a heroic tale. Though born into the accursed rot, when the young girl encountered awesome her mentor boss, and his flowing blade, she gained wings of unparalleled strength. Millennia's ridiculous attack is called the Waterfowl Dance, and aesthetically it makes sense that you know, flowing waters would counter the effects of rot. For just as still waters turn foul, stagnation turns to decay. Thus, warriors must remain ever drifting. And indeed, mm. Millennia does resist the call of the rot there's a lot of evidence that she's not really a willing vessel, but through sheer will and sense of self, she resists the rot, and only when she is truly pressed in battle will she abandon this will and bloom into the goddess within. Millennia's first bloom was during her fight against Radan, and releasing her scarlet rot was a last-ditch effort 
that would forever taint the land of Kaelid and cripple Radan. So whatever she was fighting for in this fight against Radan, somehow it was worth this terrible act. In general Sheesh. terms, at least, it's clear that Melenia was fighting for her brother. Apart from the times where she relapses into being the goddess of rot, she is known as the Blade of Mikla. She actually goes to great lengths to tell you this. I don't know if you heard. Uh, despite being the toughest boss in From Software history, she's actually fighting for his right to godhood, not her own. In Melenia's own words, her brother Mikola possesses the wisdom, the allure of a god. He is the most fearsome Empyrean of all. For his part, Mikola did a lot to earn his sister's dedication, not the least of which was inspiring her armor and a prosthetic of unalloyed gold. And it's not just his sister that loved Mikola, many people did. The Bewitching Branch is an item that you can use to turn enemies into temporary allies, and it reads, oh, Indeed, he that. has learned very well how to compel such affection. For his father Radigan, Mikola fashioned and gifted to him a fundamentalist incantation called Triple Rings of Light. Radigan then returns the favor gifting back an incantation called Radigan's Rings of Light. These interactions show some of Mikola's positive connections with his father, and also Golden Order fundamentalism. And yet, the young Mikola abandoned fundamentalism, for it could do nothing to treat Melania's accursed rot. This was the beginning of unalloyed gold. So, what is unalloyed gold? Well, an alloy is a composition of metals, so unalloyed gold is pure gold, essentially, with no external mixtures. This gold apparently can ward away the meddling of outer gods, and so Mikola bent a lot of his efforts towards creating an unalloyed gold needle. Specifically, this needle was crafted for his sister, to ward off the rot god, and forestall the effects of the incurable rotting sickness. We see the bond between the siblings as well when we visit Mikola's Halic tree. We see a statue of a one-armed woman embracing oh. the child, Mikola. In this place, we see the biggest example of I remember Mikola's seeing benevolence, that. the Halic tree, and the society that was built into the brace that supports it. This was a promised land, seen as a salvation. Can I just say you guys were absolutely right. This is by far one of the best explained videos that I've seen. He's done, he, I've seen what, I've seen not quite a few, I've seen like three, what, three, four, four of his stuff now, and this is by far the best one. My goodness, this one is awesome. To many who were shunned so and persecuted, good. provided that they can actually find the path here, of course. And like many other Empyreans, Mikola seems to have had the will within them to create a new order. And his is an order that's somewhat modeled on the ones that came before it. The biggest thing is that the Halig tree is clearly inspired by the Erd tree. But mm. the difference is that Mikola's Halig tree is said to be accepting of all, even those the Erd tree shuns. Mikola himself was once embedded inside of the Halig tree, and he watered it with his very own blood since it was a mere sapling. Tragically, however, he was ripped out of this womb during the shattering, and his Halig tree ultimately failed to grow into an Erd tree becoming a misshapen husk instead. But that's the story for another day. There's also a ton of cut content to do with Mikola, and he's one of the most mysterious demigods, who I'm sure we'll learn about more later. But there is one more thing that I want to mention before I go. It's kind of one theory I had during the making of this video. So Mikola and Millennia each have their own butterflies, Millennia's is the Aeonian butterfly, which inhabit the swamp of Aeonia, and a rumor to come from the wings of the rot goddess herself. And I think it's fair to say that Mikola's butterfly is the nascent butterfly, which mm. appears as if it's just emerged from its cocoon for its entire life. This is a reference to Mikola's eternal youth and his cocoon in the Halig tree. Okay. But there is, of course, a third butterfly, right? There's the smoldering butterfly. It's yes, said to be an the smoldering butterflies. butterfly that serves as kindling. Now bear with me, but it's my theory that this butterfly is a reference to Melina, who the Blade of Calling calls the kindling maiden and the one who walks alongside flame. This might suggest that Melina is a sibling to Melania and Mikola. 
Again, that's just a theory, but what I really want to talk about here is that, at the very least, Melina is almost certainly the daughter of Marika. We learned this a long time ago from looking at her name in the game's files, and we can further infer it from her dialogue as she has a few lines that refer to mothers and one that says that she was born inside the Erd tree. So her being the daughter of Marika is also just a theory, but this one is much more concrete than the butterfly one. Although the reason I like the butterfly theory is that it gives us a hint as to who Melina's parents might have been. Her parents would have been Radigan and Marika which is to say, Marika herself alone, I guess, because Radigan is Marika. Honestly, Melina as a character has only become more mysterious since the game was released, and I'm really only scratching the surface with this theory. Uh, but mm. speaking of times before Elden Ring was released, back then, a long time ago, I commissioned this piece from a renowned artist named Marco, and now I'm so excited to reveal it for the first time. Looks awesome. This storybook scene is heavily inspired by the early looks we had at Elden Ring, with a red-haired protagonist, spirit companions, a mount that looks like Yakul and a bit like Torrent, and a few other hidden details in the piece. This piece and all of my other prints are now available over at Spring, where you can actually buy them fully framed and ready to hang. They actually ship with a beautiful frame. The frame itself is a nice black satin finish, and you can even opt for a white border around the print, which I think looks really classy in certain cases. I think these posters are a cool way to support the channel and artists, and for you to actually get something in return that will make your room look better. So check out my prints if you're interested, but this is the end, and thank you for watching. I'll see you next time. Awesome. Awesome, awesome, awesome. All right, make sure to like the video. And yeah, that was it from uh, Varty, and that is also it from me. Awesome stuff, really good video, really enjoyed it. So much we learned, and uh, actually quite enjoyed his theory about the, uh, the Menina thing. I think that could be quite accurate, to be honest. They're all related anyway, so why not one more, you know? So yeah, all right, guys. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please smash the like button. If you're new here, subscribe. And very soon, we will start Dark Souls 2. Looking forward to it. I'll catch you there. Take it easy. Peace.